Do you remember when opening credit sequences went down to being about 5 seconds long? Stargate were joking about their overly long opening credit sequence 15 years ago. And now, we get 30 seconds of production logos, we get 2 minutes of opening credits. It's from outer space. First contact with aliens always lives. Okay, it's not the first time we've seen first contact with Starfleet from an alien point of view. But would they call a starship a UFO? Confirmed. UFO is not of planetary origin. It's I find that a bit strange. It seems like they took exactly one criticism of Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery to heart, because here is a ship which is non-standard. And that's the criticism of the Star Trek Picard Season 1 finale, that all of the ships look the same. So now we get this weird thing. I would have preferred to see a Constitution class or something else established, but this is a pretty solid opening to the episode. Scene 2 and we get Captain Pike. For some reason they're trying to give him a psychological trauma backstory based on the vision that he got from the Klingon time crystal. I miss when Star Trek was just about people who were professionals who were just doing a good job in space. But now they all have to have this bizarre backstory instead. First contact is just a dream. Until one day, it isn't. We haven't heard from her since. I want you to find out what happened to Una. You can quit when you get home, but right now I need you back on that horse, Captain. So they give number one a name, and the name is Una. Una as in the feminine form of Uno, as in numero uno, as in number one. Number one isn't called number one because she's the first officer. It's because her name is literally the number one. That's that's a nice touch. That's That's great. Good work. Why are there wind turbines in Star Trek? Star Trek has unlimited, completely clean, renewable energy from antimatter production warp cores and stuff like that. They don't need renewable energy from wind turbines. This is stupid. This is anachronistic. So Una, along with her ship, has gone missing on a first contact mission. And the Enterprise is the only ship in range to go and deal with it. Apparently they decided to take their inspiration from Star Trek V The Final Frontier. That's not a good choice. To seek out new life. And that's 1 minute 50 of opening credit before we get to Spock on Vulcan. So, Spock's on a date, and his date is wearing ritual mating colours. You are wearing ritual mating colours. So I am. Except that they've washed out all of the colours in post-production, so everything is the same colour. When your scene relies on people having different coloured clothing, maybe make sure that they actually have colours in their clothing. So this completely breaks Star Trek canon and continuity. Uh, the woman Spock was meant to marry in a mock time in the original series was an arranged marriage and the woman that he hadn't met in many many years. In fact I think since they were both children. But here this woman is asking him to marry him with an engagement necklace which Vulcans don't use. And then they kiss each other on the lips which Vulcans don't do. They do the fingertip thing. So this entire scene is just written by someone who didn't even bother checking Star Trek wiki on Memory Alpha didn't bother with continuity or canon or researching what Vulcans do in this sort of area and just wanted a very generic, very sort of earth human scene with a love interest who I'm sure is going to disappear before the end of the season because we know she's not there later on because this is a prequel and then the waiter asks them to leave because this is not how Vulcans do things I'm going to have to ask you two to do that somewhere else please so then we get naked post-coital Vulcans. <laughs> Apparently they forgot all about the Ponfar as well. And Captain Pike seems very put out by Spock being naked. Spock, are you naked? No, Captain. I don't know why he'd care. I assume he knows that people are naked sometimes. So why not just get down to telling Spock whatever it is that he's contacting him to say? Enterprise, this is Shuttle Stamets, incoming to transport coordinates. Okay, so they named the shuttle after Stamets from Discovery. I don't really want to be reminded of Discovery, but okay. And then they redo the Star Trek the motion picture scene where they fly around the Enterprise. That's fine, the best stuff here is the stuff we've kept in Pike in, and the worst stuff is everything other than the stuff we've kept in Pike in. I am well, Captain. Although I confess, each time I return to space, the weight I carry over the loss of my sister feels heavier. No, don't remind me of Michael either. I really don't need to be reminded of Discovery right now. Lieutenant La'an Nunian Singh, Chief of Security. The new number one is called La'an... <laughs> the new number one is called La'an Nunian Singh. Uh, do they 
Do they know who Khan Noonien Singh is? Is this an intentional reference, or did they just get this name off Memory Alpha? This, this, if that's an intentional reference, that is, that's a very bizarre decision. Uh, I'm not sure how to say this, but there are a lot of non-white guys on this bridge. I, I could have predicted that, but that is, that is quite a lot. In fact, the only white male characters we've seen so far are ones that were created in 1965. Ah, yes, the prodigy. Cadet Uhura? This is your captain? We're a little early out of the gate, so I hope we didn't catch anybody with your hair wet or your pants down. They don't, they don't have wet hair because they use sonic showers, but... Okay, nice try, nice try. Let me know when we get there. I'll be in my quarters. Number one, you have the comm. Uh, <laughs> they just called the con the com. That's that's not right. That's the con. It's a naval term. It's not just from Star Trek. They could have easily googled this. And if you think it sounds like con and not com, well, the subtitles also say com. Ah, uh, okay. They they're using the Star Wars hyperspace effects outside the window. Well, I suppose we can't expect any better from New Trek. I saw my own death, Spock. Know exactly how and when my life ends. So this is a problem that they've inherited from Star Trek Discovery, which is that Pike doesn't die from the Delta Waves. Pike gets his face horribly burned off and is hideously crippled and disfigured and, and becomes a hideous, disfigured, crippled freak. But he doesn't actually die from the Delta Waves. If you watch Star Trek the original series, they take him to Talos IV and he lives out the rest of his life there. Presumably for many many years, maybe even decades, so this is not him seeing his death. And this isn't just him assuming that that's his death, they told him in Discovery that he would see his death and it would be unchangeable. So now he's got all this psychological trauma about seeing his inevitable death when he's not actually going to die like that. I really wish the writers would just check the things that they're referencing, you know? So I like Captain Pike, I like Anson Mount playing Captain Pike, but this whole psychological trauma storyline is really dragging down the entire thing. The dumb person way of giving a character complexity yeah. is to have a horrible tragic event in their past that defines them. We're a third away through the episode and the plot has barely even started yet. All because they're focusing on him having hallucinations of his own supposed future death. That's, as I say, that's not actually how he dies. Let's spend a bit more time on the actual plot and a bit less time on the psychological baggage of the characters. How in the hell did these people develop a faster than light engine? Plasma torpedoes? That's 21st century tech. Okay, uh, firstly, plasma torpedoes are something that are invented after this in Star Trek the original series by the Romulans. That's not 21st century technology. Secondly, we're in the 21st century now and we don't have plasma torpedoes that we can shoot at spaceships. Thirdly, 21st century technology doesn't necessarily contradict the idea of having a warp drive. Because if you remember, humans developed their warp drive in the aftermath of the Third World War in like 2068 or something like that. That's 21st century technology. These people have not built a warp drive. They've built a warp bomb. Okay, warp bomb is a stupid term. Why not just antimatter bomb? I mean, it's just as destructive. You just don't have to give it such a stupid name. How is that possible? As you know, the Vulcans invented first contact. Uh, first contact is just meeting an alien species for the first time. It's not something that was invented by the Vulcans, or by anyone else for that matter. They are genetically engineering La'an and Noonien Singh. Uh, th that seems like a bad idea. Also unnecessary when they can just do plastic surgery to make people fit in, like they do with Riker and other people throughout the Star Trek era. Also, why is Nurse Chapel a genetic research scientist? Why can't she just be a nurse? It's fine for people to be nurses. We need nurses. You know, not everyone has to be a doctor or a research scientist. Nurse, nurse is fine. Why do they beam down in their uniforms and then have the transporters change their clothing for them. Why not just change beforehand, as they always have done before? Uh, they thought they were so clever when they wrote that, and it's just stupid. Sure is responsive. It's fortunate that you can finally take a hint. No sedatives, just a gene therapy. I understand. Are you giving me a direct order to allow sedation during this procedure, Captain? Beam them up where? 
Well, sick bay can sedate them. Oh, it's one of those series with a female lead who's right about everything and takes all the initiative and makes a fool out of everyone around her and is a monstrous hypocrite who refuses to be sedated for medical procedures while insisting that other people be sedated against their will. That's just what I was looking for. That's that's great. That's I'm very happy with it. Kyle, can you pinpoint a location and beam down and apply an eye south? Uh, are you kidding? No, transporters don't do that. Oh, transporters don't do that. Oh, okay. Nice to see they can't just do anything. They, they can change your clothes on your body, but they can't apply an eye self. Energize it. Emergency medical transporter. Isn't sight to sight on board ship transport incredibly dangerous in this period? Isn't it likely that you'll just beam straight into a bulkhead and die? Oh, whatever. That wouldn't happen if you just used cosmetic surgery instead of genetic augmentation. If we leave now, every death that follows is on our hands. Spock, you're with me. The rest of you get back to the ship. Captain. You know, Pike, you can beam up and then beam back down again. You don't have to just stay, especially not when you've already been discovered by the native people. Remember when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. The Kikuyu people of Kenya, Africa, on Earth, they teach us that lesson every day. The Kikuyu people of Africa teach us that every day. They must be very busy. General Order 1 clearly states we cannot... Screw General Order 1. Don't they swear an oath specifically to die for the Prime Directive if it's necessary? Don't break it. Wait, so the ship, the Archer, had no life signs on board and they rescued three people from the surface of the planet was this ship which is most of the size of a constitution class which has 400 crew members was this really what they sent with only three people on board to make first contact that's ridiculous you know the gorn captured my family's colony ship and deposited us on one of their planetary nurseries before they were slit open and fed on alive or used as breeding sacks why? Why is it the Gorn? Why have they made it the Gorn? The Federation have no contact with the Gorn at this point in time. We see first contact in the original series, which is set after this. <sighs> also, the whole point of that episode, one of the best remembered episodes of the original series, is that actually the Gorn and the humans are basically the same, and they ought to be able to get along because they can just negotiate, they aren't inherently at war because they're not different types of being. So it somewhat contradicts that in this episode when she talks about how they ate her parents and used innocent people as breathing sacs. I don't even know what a breathing sac is. I don't want to know what a breathing sac is. But this is very inappropriate. Very inappropriate. This is Earth in our 21st century. Before everything went wrong. The 21st century before it all went wrong. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? I know there's the eugenics wars and the sanctuary districts and the third world war and the, the Borg and the first contact and all that, but in Star Trek wasn't the third world war the thing that ultimately spurred mankind to do better and to make peace and to contact aliens and go out into the stars and ultimately form the foundation. That's not when things went wrong, that's when things started to go right. Again, they just, they completely misunderstand everything in the source material, just willfully. Join our Federation of Planets. And reach for the stars. Uh, uh, no. You don't just invite anyone with warp drive to join the Federation. It's, it's a years long process, even after peaceful diplomatic relations have been established. Which, in this case, they have not. They're doubling down, renaming it the Prime Directive. Prime Directive. Shut up. Well, that'll never stick. Lieutenant Kirk is on his way to the bridge as you requested. Thank you, number one. Oh, man. Samuel Kirk. Welcome to Enterprise. You know, I appreciate the Kirk fake out because if they're really going to have Samuel Kirk instead of James Kirk, hopefully that means they won't ruin Kirk for us. Or any more than it already has been, I mean. Any more than the New Trek movies did. Kirk is maybe the most misunderstood of all Star Trek characters consistently from the original series movies onwards completely misrepresented and this could only possibly make it worse so please give us Orlan, give us Sam, give us him leaving to the colony world where he will 
die possessed by a space brain cell, but just leave Captain Kirk out of it. And then there's just the this season on Star Trek Strange New Worlds part. And they reuse footage from this episode. I mean, technically okay, that is this season, but still, it seems a bit misleading. And best of all, they've got Nurse Chapel running around in power armour. They really hate nurses on this show. Really hate them. So that's it. That's... That's, uh... That's the end of Star Trek. That's just the last dregs being completely ruined by these soulless corporate hacks. End. After season two of Picard, there's an obvious question here, which is, why do they keep bringing up to the, the eugenics wars? The eugenics wars were meant to happen in the 1990s, and that's because it was written in the 60s. So when they brought it up in Deep Space Nine, they had to, they, they just had to like set it a bit later, and they were like, yeah, it happened, happened later, still happened, didn't happen at the same time, let's move on. And that was fine. But it doesn't work when you're basing your entire chronology around it, when you're having people time travel back to it, when you're rewriting your entire history and chronology around moving it forward in time. You're just highlighting the flaws in the whole thing, and it's getting really annoying. <coughs> so, uh, as generic science fiction, this is pretty bad. It's like a 4 out of 10. Uh, the overall plot of the episode mm, almost makes sense. As Star Trek, it is absolutely unbearably terrible. Uh, it is a 0 out of 10. I cannot possibly recommend it. I can only hate it. And I hope that it will soon cease to be.